Well, good morning, everyone. If you're new, my name is Mark, one of the pastors here at the bridge. Um, Real quick, let me, as Rachel just alluded to in the prayer, talk a little bit about yesterday. I'm sure that's on everyone's minds. Um, I, uh, as I'm sure most of you were, were in complete shock. Um, And so here's what I wanna say about that. I am uh, my pastoral heart. Uh, I am grieving and very, um, sad, and, and I don't mean this out of fear, but worried about our country. And here's what I mean, because it may not mean maybe what you think it means. Um, I mean, I decided three months ago to do a series on uh, politics, the church, and culture. And so we're going to be starting that five weeks from now. And something that, I mean, A, we've realized this since COVID. Um, but I was just so convicted a couple months ago that, man, we're in an election year that is going to get nasty. Um, I'm under the impression that it's going to get nastier, and this is before yesterday, um, nastier than uh, the previous one. And so I was like, we need to get ahead of this and address this pastorally. This isn't about a, here's how you should vote. It's more so of how do you hold your politics? And um, so obviously it goes without saying, man, violence is never the answer. And I say that for both sides. So obviously that was attempted on the former president Trump yesterday, but even if that had been Biden or Bush or Obama, whoever, you know, whoever your president is, um, It goes without saying that violence is never the answer. And I find it so convicting and so timely that the great rabbi 2000 years ago, Jesus of Nazareth said, love your enemies. Our nation has become politically polarized. Whatever side you're on, I'm speaking to both sides. And the call for the church is to love your enemies. My heart breaks and is fearful of that. The amount of stuff that I saw on social media last night, and I, unfortunately, I went back on social media about five days ago, and I'm like, oh man, I shouldn't have, because I took two months off. From both sides, and the things that I saw people saying, whoa. So, we condemn violence, and we promote love, not out of like a hippie generic sense, but out of like a Jesus-y, we love our enemies. If you're a Democrat, if you're a Republican, and by the way, we have both in this church because I know people of both sides. Um, now is the time to follow Jesus of Nazareth. The Apostle Paul, don't overcome evil with evil. What's precisely wrong with our country, and by the way, there's a lot of good of it too. I don't think our country is a failure and all that kind of stuff. Um, But if we're not careful, we will be going down a very, very, very destructive path. And that more so has to do with how you hold your politics, okay? So may we be a church that's known for unity and diversity, go vote, it matters. But you know what matters more? is treating people with dignity on both sides. And while I'm at it, a little teaser for that series. So we will start that series in five weeks, August 18th. It'll be called uh, The Church, Politics and Culture, four Sundays. Um, I'm going to be talking about, and I've been doing a ton of reading in the last two months. You can ask my wife. Uh, I think our living room right now is like a politics room. I'm going to be talking about the, the new religion in American culture and its politics. Politics has become a new religion on both sides. So we're going to lift up King Jesus and say that Jesus is King. Then we're going to talk about loving your enemy and loving those you disagree with. That's a part of life. And that actually matters more to me. Thirdly, we're going to talk about unity. 
What does it mean to be Republican and Democrat and follow Jesus together? And then fourthly, very practically, you know, there's that verse in James, be slow to speak, quick to listen. What if that was our political climate? All right, enough. Uh, This morning, we have four more Sundays in the book of Exodus. Uh, Last Sunday, we officially entered the last stretch of this book. um, And the last stretch of Exodus is all about what's called the tabernacle. We'll put up a a picture. This is, uh, please uh, hear me loud and clear on this. This isn't the tabernacle. This is a modern day replica of it. But I think it is helpful to give a visual uh, when we read and hear and talk about the tabernacle. This is what we're talking about. Um, For Israel, this was a mobile tent, a mobile temple where God's presence would dwell in that tent and they would pick this up and they would move and set it up as they went through the desert all the way to the promised land. So this is the tabernacle and the last stretch of Exodus is simply, literally, all about that. Uh, Now, to give you a further lay of the land from a literary structure standpoint of where we're at, next graphic. So... Exodus 25 through 31 is all about instructions of how to build the tabernacle. Then chapters 35 through 40 um, literally is the exact same thing. It's repeated. Now there's a reason for that. And when it's repeated in 35 through 40, it's actually done in the past tense. And that is done, we think, to show that they obeyed literally how God told them to build it. You'll notice there in the middle, though, there's this three-chapter breakup, 32 to 34. Um, And if you grew up in the church, you'll know about this. It's the famous golden calf incident. And if you didn't, the next two Sundays after this, I will be talking about Exodus 32 to 34. Because it is no mistake that in between the instructions of the tabernacle, Israel commits idolatry. And that is smack dab right in the middle, and it's there on purpose. The author is trying to tell us something. Um, So that is where we're going. I just kind of wanted to place things for you. Um, And then we'll end on August 11th on chapter 40, at the very end of that, where Yahweh literally takes up residence in the tabernacle, and the glory cloud comes down, all right? With that in mind, let's dig in. Um, so if you hear last Sunday, Pastor Brock pretty much gave us a tour de France, if you will, of um, theologically what the tabernacle is. And so from Exodus all the way through the whole Bible into the New Testament, there's this pattern of God coming to dwell with his people. So he first came to dwell in a tabernacle, then he came to dwell in a temple, then you go to the New Testament, Jesus of Nazareth shows up and God dwells in human form. And then the radical thing that Jesus does is he says, now the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to dwell in you individually and as a corporate church. And now we are the temple. We are the tabernacle. And so you see this huge progression starting in Exodus all the way to the end of the Bible of God dwelling with his people. That was last week. Here's what I want to do this morning. This is going to be a very interesting topic. Um, I want us to look at the architectural design and building of this actual physical tabernacle. All right, we're going to look at the actual architectural design of this tabernacle. So turn with me to Exodus 31. Um, If you need a Bible this morning, we have free orange ones. You can take them home. They are yours. I'll be reading from that in page 60. So we're going to be in Exodus 31 this morning, verses 1 through 11. Are we doing good? Who's ready to eat? All right. Oh, getting spiritual, Elena. But we're going to learn this morning that actually everything is spiritual. But all right. So then the Lord said to Moses, see, I have chosen Bezazel, 
son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kind of skills to make artistic designs for work in gold and silver and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of crafts. Moreover, I have appointed, and I don't know how to say his name, so I'm just going to say Oholib, son of Ahisamak of the tribe of Dan to help him. And I've given ability to all skilled workers to make everything I've commanded you. And here's what they made. The tent of meeting, the ark of the covenant with the atonement cover on it, and all the other furnishings of the tent. The table and its articles, the pure gold lampstand and all its accessories, the altar of incense, the altar burnt offering and its utensils, the basin with its stand. And also, I mean, there are fashion designers in the Bible, the woven garments, both the sacred garments for Aaron, the priest and the garments for his son, where they serve as priests. And, and this is not talking about doTERRA right here, but the anointing oil and fragrant incense for the holy place. About four of you got that. They are to make them just as I commanded you. All right. So if you've been around the bridge for a while, sometimes I make fun of myself. But probably the area that I can make the most fun of myself is that I am the least handy person that you will ever meet in your life. Now, I tell people that, and they laugh just like you did, Um, But they don't necessarily take me at my word for that. They think I'm like just joking. But I'm being completely honest. I am the least handy guy that you will ever meet in your life. Example, when Rachel and I first got married and we moved to an apartment, uh, there's kind of this like basic coat rack thing. And then a couple like framed pictures. We're talking, you know, eight by 11, seven by five, whatever. Hey, Mark, can you put these up in the hallway? All I need, measuring tape, a couple of nails and a hammer. And that was the problem because that's what I needed. I can't do that. I can't do it straight. I literally made the wall worse after trying to do it because then it was punctured with tons of little holes because I can't make it straight. And I'm not joking. Are you making fun of me, Elena? All right. So little house projects, uh, putting up security cameras, fixing a flat tire, you want me to go as far away from those as possible because I, it's not that I can't fix them. I'll make it worse. <laughs> and as a pastor, I can truly say, hey, it's not my fault. Go blame the heavenly father. He didn't give me those gifts. It's not my calling. <laughs> I actually have self-awareness and I know what I should and shouldn't be doing. Most dangerous people who are, are the people who aren't self-aware. So, All over the Loman household are many broken things. And to give you an example, I mean, again, this is real stuff, folks. This is just like two days ago. Here's, so here, uh, context, we have a little like cabinet door in our living room. It's been like this for like four years. Do we have it? No. No. My wife will love you if you come over to our house and fix that. That may or may not have been a reason why I also shared that. Any other guys here not handy? This is a safe place. Oh, yes. Oh, your wife's holding up your hand. Bryant, me and you, bud. Me and you. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. You're a chef. Dude, I can't even cook. I can't fix things. I can't cook. But I'll talk theology and politics all day long. You know what? Here's a message for you. Our masculinity is not defined by our handiwork. Can I get a hallelujah? Just me and Brian. Me and Brian. So Moses, 
presumably raised in elite Egyptian school. He grew up as kind of Pharaoh's adopted son, if you know the story from a couple months ago. Moses would have had an elite education. He, and in that culture, very rare, would have been able to read and write and literally probably organize a nation. This is Moses, we think. Moses certainly would not have had the skills to build a tabernacle. Wasn't his divine calling. Now, God called Moses. He called him to lead a people. But he did not call him to build a tabernacle. And so five chapters before this, so chapter 25, that's where this tabernacle section begins. Um, It's almost like Yahweh, God tells Moses, hey, here are the blueprints. Here are the architectural drawings for building this tabernacle. Here's the the patterns. Here's the, the cloth. Here are the dimensions, the layout, all the pieces, the furniture, the color. I mean, this is extremely detailed stuff. And now he's like, hey, I have two guys that I have called and gifted with my spirit for this particular purpose, which is what? To build and to make this tabernacle according to the blueprints that I have given you. So what we're talking about this morning is the role, the calling, and the purpose of these two guys, Bezazel and the one I don't know how to say, Ohalib. And who knows, all right? Can I just call him Oho? It just sounds better. Just making this up. That sounds like some trendy resort place. Hey, are you going to Oho this weekend? Yes. Anyways, all right. For us to really understand, and here, here's where I can live into my calling right here, because this is cool. For you to really understand the architecture of the tabernacle, you got to look at, and this is going to sound weird at first, you got to look at Genesis 1 and the creation narrative. Because the building of the tabernacle and the building of this world, the cosmos, I'm going to say is there's a direct pattern and correlation between the two. Uh, one of the dynamics, if you've been here the last four months, is that I'm I'm kind of continuously taking us back to Genesis because Exodus is completely tied to its preceding book, the book of Genesis. So one of the points I said is you can't understand Exodus unless you understand Genesis, and then really you can't understand the Bible unless you understand Exodus. What God creates in Genesis 1, and then that spirals out of control, In Exodus, God begins to put things back together. And it takes the rest of the Bible to do that. So I want to take us back, surprise, surprise, to Genesis 1. Look at some stuff, and then we hop back in in Exodus 31. Are we ready? Okay. Man, I'm a little extra jazzed this morning. I don't know if it's the potluck. Got Paul Morgan in the house. Maybe that's it. I don't know. Genesis 1, 2. Here we go. We'll start actually the first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. Oh, come on. Here it is. And the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Point number one. I'm going to connect it afterwards. When God created the world, the spirit of God was active in the creation. Remember that. Second thing to point out. I don't, we don't need to read for this one. Um, how, many, how many days of creation in the, in the creation narrative? Seven. Now, by the way, whether you take that literal, metaphorical, doesn't matter. The point is, it's seven. So because of that, seven times we read the phrase, God said. So God said, let there be light. God said, let there be waters. God said, let there be creatures, right? I mean, seven times God said, because there's seven days of creation. Third point, to go even deeper into that, technically, well, I mean, there is seven days, but the seventh is unique. What is the seventh day in Genesis 1? The Sabbath, which means the day of rest. So those are the three points I want you to have in your mind. In Genesis 1, the Spirit of God is active in creation. Seven times, it's God said, and then creation ends with a Sabbath. Now, take those three aspects of creation Let's go back to Exodus 31. 
Verse one. Oh, and here, by the way, here's a phrase for you. Then the Lord said to Moses, keep track of that. See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah. What does it say right here? And I have filled him with the spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, with all kinds of skills. At the very beginning of the building of this tabernacle, we read clear, I mean, it clears day that the spirit of God has come in to fill these designers. Spirit of God, Genesis 1, 2. Exodus 31, verse 2, spirit of God. Okay, next one. If you look at this tabernacle section, Chapters 25 to 31, which is why I showed you that outline at the beginning. So in that six chapter block section, which is um, the, the, the detailed architectural drawings, of the tabernacle, guess how many times we read the phrase, the Lord said to Moses, seven. Do you think that's by chance? I don't think so. What was seven in Genesis 1? the number of the days of creation, and seven times we read that God said. Oh, well now here in Exodus 31, the spirit of God is active, filling someone for creation. And then, oh, by the way, now we're reading seven times that the Lord said to Moses. But it gets better. Interesting, Interesting. yeah. What happens on the seventh day in this tabernacle construction narrative? Any guesses? Oh, we have a smart crowd here. A Sabbath day of rest. Right after, in chapter 31, verses 1 through 11, verse 12, immediately, like there's not even a break, just immediately, we just so happen to start hearing about the Sabbath. Let's read it, verse 12. And oh, by the way, here's that phrase again. Then the Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, You must observe my Sabbaths. And this will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come so that you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. Boom, observe the Sabbath because it is holy to you. Anyone who desecrates it is to be put to death and those who do any work on that day must be cut off from their people. Oh, and then this is as clear as it gets. Verse 15, for six days work is to be done, but the seventh day is a day of rest. Uh, holy to the Lord, whoever does any work on the Sabbath day is to be put to death. The Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for the generations to come as a lasting covenant. And it'll be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. Here it is. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. So we'll put up the second slide now. In Exodus 31, We see the exact same three points. First one, spirit of God, active in creation of the tabernacle. The spirit of God fills Bezalel and Oho. Number two, seven times we read the Lord said to Moses. Genesis 1, seven times God speaks. Number three, the tabernacle creation ends with Sabbath. Now, I don't think that that's chance. I happen to think that the Bible is, at minimum, brilliant literature. Now, I can show you even more, but I know that we all, all want to go eat some food. So let me just name drop a couple more things. There's a light lampstand in the tabernacle. It's got six branches. Looks like a tree. You think that's accidental? Is there a tree in Genesis 2, the tree of life? Yeah. Not an accident. It's another Genesis echo. Um, Here's another one. Inside the Holy of Holies, on on the lid that covers the ark, which is the the, the Ten Commandments that Moses receives, they they put that in the ark, and there's there's a lid over it. Guess what's on that lid? Two, uh, Two angels, two cherubim. Well, where else do we see two cherubim? 
Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden, there's two cherubim placed on the outside of the garden so that nobody else comes back in. Lampstand tree, tree of life. Two cherubim, Genesis 3. Two cherubim, Exodus 31. This isn't accidental. There is a direct parallel pattern between the creation of the world and the creation of the tabernacle. Genesis 1, and now two guys, two construction workers, constructing the tabernacle in Exodus 31. Here's my point, all this to say. The tabernacle is a mini creation. The tabernacle uh, is a microcosmos. Uh, The tabernacle is the recreation of the world on a small scale. Old Testament uh, Exodus scholar Christopher Wright, he sums this up in his Exodus commentary. Let me read it for you. So it appears that by his spirit, God has endowed Bezalel and Oho and later Urim with the same creative gifting that in its infinite divine expression had crafted the cosmos itself. We are justified then in seeing a connection between God's making the world and Bezalel's constructing the tabernacle. Taking these references into account, the impression is given that Bezalel constructs earthly sanctuaries with the same qualities that God used to construct the world. This parallel is noteworthy because ancient Israelites viewed the tabernacle and temple as models of the cosmos. And I could go way more into that, but I don't want to bore you. Here's the big point I want to make this morning for you. God calls and equips human beings, you and I. He calls construction workers. He calls manual laborers. He calls an artist, a craftsman, a skilled laborer to use their skills to make a place where God's presence and beauty and glory are known. Bezalel and Oho are mirroring, are imitating the way that God creates in Genesis 1. This is rad. This is rad that God has humans do this. And not just that he has humans do this, this is rad that God wants humans to do this. That God has created you and designed you and I to do this and to be just like him. Here's a fun question. Do you know who is the first person, first person, to be filled with the Holy Spirit in the Bible. Man, this is probably the only time I'm going to say it. That's not the right answer. <clears throat> right here, Exodus 31. From what we read in the Bible, this is the first time that a human being is filled with the Spirit of God. Go check it out. Bezalel, right here, Exodus 31, verses two to three. See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills. Fascinating stuff. Now, speaking of this, one one blogger wrote this. Do you know who the first person in scripture is to be filled with the spirit? It's not Abraham, it's not Joseph, it's not Moses, or even Aaron the priest. It's two men called to cut stone, carve wood, shape metal, embroider cloth, and teach others to do the same. In the midst of this grand sweeping Exodus story about God miraculously delivering his people from Egypt, and in the shadow of legendary, larger-than-life figures like Moses and Aaron and Miriam. Oh, I love this. It was two blue-collar manual laborers who were said to be filled with the Spirit to do work in accordance with all that the Lord had commanded. Now, if that doesn't get you excited, I don't know what does. And that comes from someone who's not handy. I'll come back to that. Um. Let me also say this. This was not common. So it's not often that you read in the Old Testament 
that the spirit of God comes in to fill someone. And that's because then when we get to the New Testament and the day of Pentecost, Brock talked about that last Sunday, that is where then Jesus sends out the Holy Spirit to equip his followers to be mini tabernacles. But that hasn't happened yet. That's New Testament. This is Exodus. It's very rare in the Old Testament for the spirit of God to fall on someone. And it's just crazy that the first time that we read about this is a construction worker. Someone who makes things beautiful, the tabernacle for God to dwell in. Um, See, God is a divine, sophisticated architect. God loves to make things. You know that God loves to, to build things. That's why we say God is creator, he is designer, and he has made you and I with the exact same skills. We are made in his image and he empowers you to build and to make things to showcase his presence and beauty. In other words, let me put this simply, God loves manual labor. God loves getting his hands and his feet messy. God is the master craftsman. Now think about this. There's this great uh, quote from a guy named Philip Jensen. That's one of my, all, one of my all-time favorite quotes. He, he puts this. He says, if God came into the world, what would he be like? Well, for the ancient Greeks, he might have been a philosopher king. The ancient Romans might have looked for a just and noble statesman. But how does the God of the Hebrews come into the world? As a carpenter, come on. Modern day America, how, if God came, oh, he'd come as a politician. He'd come as a celebrity. No. It's like God comes as a landscaper, a woodworker. Hello, this is crazy. And here's why it's crazy. Modern day American culture, we tend to devalue what's called blue collar work and we favor what's called white collar work. So uh, head work is elevated and hand work is devalued. This is why software developers, CEOs, managers, lawyers, this is why they make so much more money. This is why those positions are usually more highly esteemed and have a societal kind of identity status to them. And what this does is then people who work with their hands, what I'm calling manual labors, they feel like their work doesn't matter. Not so in the kingdom of God. How does God view manual labor? Well, I'll tell you how God views manual labor because in Jesus of Nazareth, God became flesh as a blue collar worker and a master woods craftsman. And what's more, according to Exodus 31, manual work is spiritual work. Manual work is spiritual work. See, it's not just with your mind that you can know God's presence. Oh, no, 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 no. It's also by your hands that you can show his beauty. It's with your hands that you can show his beauty. And I think in a lot of ways, modern day American Christian culture now has been influenced by secular culture and we've bought into and developed this Stupid, false, sacred, and secular dichotomy. And um, what do I mean by that? We segment churchy, sacred God things over here and then secular work things over here. So here's what we do. In the church, oh yeah, sacred stuff. Um, we think that the Holy Spirit comes to fill us, that we are spiritually filled with God's presence um, and so we get thing, gifts like faith and hope and love. Uh, we talked about uh, Vanessa and Carrie in the prayer team, gifts of healing uh, or gifts of prophecy, um, gifts of even administration, gifts of generosity. And absolutely, hear, hear me loud and clear so you don't, you don't misunderstand me. Those are 110% gifts of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul talks about them multiple times in his letters. But 
Here's an example in the Bible. In Exodus 31, where the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, fills two guys for manual labor. You ever taken a spiritual gift survey that has that listed? And it's not just for the sake of manual labor. Let me be clear here. But it's to make something carefully crafted so that it showcases the glory and beauty and the presence of God. The tabernacle. See, we think that to experience God's beauty, that like, oh, you know, you got to be in church on a Sunday morning or you got to be listening to worship music on Alexa in your house as you're washing the dishes or, you know, or in, in order to experience the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, you got to be feeding the poor or, or you got to be sharing your faith. Those are all good things. And absolutely, you will encounter the Holy Spirit and he will fill you to equip you to do those things. Hallelujah. But we tend to consider those the sacred things and then, oh, you know, just the work that I do for my job or like physical things that you make. Well, you know, those are just secular, non-sacred, non-Holy Spirit, non-churchy things. None of those things have to do with the presence of God. It's not churchy stuff. This is secular stuff. That's sacred stuff. No, that is the false sacred and secular divide that we subconsciously live out of in America and it is not biblical at all. In 1874, the great British preacher, Charles Spurgeon, um, he was giving a sermon that was all about uh, serving God in like every area of your life. So not segmenting the sacred from the secular. And it's interesting because he actually drew imagery from the tabernacle in this passage of Exodus 31. And I point that out so that you can recognize the imagery that he's giving as I read this part of his sermon. And he applies it to modern day Bezalels. Now remember, this is 19th century old English culture, so bear with him. But he says this, To a man who lives unto God, nothing is secular. Everything is sacred. He puts on his workday garment and it is a vestment to him. He sits down to his meal and it is a sacrament. He goes forth to his labor and he exercises the office of the priesthood. And then my my wife tells me this every morning when I wake up. His breath is incense. No. Intense, not incense, okay. And his life is sacrifice. He sleeps on the bosom of God, whatever that means, and he lives and moves in the divine presence to draw a hard and fast line and say, this is sacred and this is secular is to my mind diametrically opposed to the teaching of Christ and the spirit of the gospel. The Lord has cleansed your houses, my brothers and sisters. He has cleansed your bedchambers, your tables, your shops. He has made the bells upon your horses holiness to the Lord. He has made the common pots and pans of your kitchen to be as the bowls before the altar if you know what you are and you live according to your high calling. You housemaids, you cooks, you nurses, you plowmen, you housewives, you traders, you sailors, your labor is holy if you serve the Lord Christ in it, if by living unto him as you ought to live, the sacred has absorbed the secular. Oh, come on. Now, here's the hard part. Let me ask you this. Do you view your work as a place where God's presence and beauty can be known? Do you view your work as a place where God's presence and power and beauty are known? Or do you view your work simply as a way to get a paycheck? Oh, it's just a job to pay the bills. Now, you got to pay the bills. (laughs) You got to work. But what if instead it's so much more than a paycheck? 
What if instead God has called and equipped and gifted you to work not just for a paycheck or an identity status, because that's an American problem too, but as a way to reflect the beauty and presence of Yahweh, just like Bezazel and Oho. So we pray here passionately. I mean, it's our vision here. We pray out to ears at the bridge, come Holy Spirit. But when you say that, do you expect the Holy Spirit to show up at your job at work and not just here at service? Or are you tempted to section God off from your work and you want to put a divide up and compartmentalize the sacred and the secular? Mark, I'm just a construction worker, bro. There ain't nothing beautiful about that. Mark, I just cut hair for a living. Mark, or, you know, you're an artist, you're a carpenter, and you're an electrician or a plumber. Do you not think that God calls and equips electricians and plumbers and carpenters and artists and construction workers to showcase the glory of God? Oh, you bet he does. Because manual skills reveal the beauty of him. See, God is known through preachers, sure, and plumbers. God is known through medical doctors, sure, and construction workers. God is known through software developers and artists. God has given you a gift and a calling wherever you are and whatever you are doing, and it is not just to earn a paycheck. You want meaning for your job? You want meaning for work? Follow Jesus. Now, here's the crazier thing there's a good chance that you'll be doing that for the rest of your life. And I'm not just talking about this age. I'm talking about actually the age to come for eternity. Whoa, Mark, what do you mean? I got to tell you guys, I got to get a new job. Pastors and doctors. I'm going to have to go through a new job training when the new heavens and new earth comes. Tim Keller says this, when we get to heaven, ministers and doctors will have to have a new job training, whereas architects and artists will not. You get what he's saying? Man, you don't, you don't need me in new heavens. Or earth. You don't need to proclaim the word of God. He's going to be right smack dab in front of you. You don't need doctors. You know that bad back? Yeah, you don't got to go to that bad doctor who you have to call him 15 times to make an appointment and you get there and you wait two hours. Woo, it's worse than the pain. He's out of a job. Lawyers, going to have to get a new job because there's complete justice in the new heavens and the new earth, the ultimate lawyers there. But if you're an artist, a craftsman, an architect, a landscaper, man, you, you think there's going to be perfect green grass in the new heavens and the new earth that has perfectly straight stripes? Oh, you better believe it. And there's going to be someone doing that. It's people like me that have to get a new job. And because of that, even though I'm not handy, I make stuff worse after I touch it. I have learned, and now I'm being very serious, that there is something profoundly spiritual. And I don't mean that in a new age way. I mean this in a Jesus-y way. There is something profoundly spiritual of connecting with our creator and actually imitating him when you do something tactile and palpable that showcases the glory of God like a tabernacle. Um, For me and Rachel, it's been starting a little garden in our massive 20 by 20 cement side backyard. (laughs) It's building a sandcastle with my son at Baby Beach. It's my wife, Rachel, a couple years ago, starting a hobby, making clay earrings because she just wanted to do something tactile, palpable with her hands, rather than head work, hand work. And then that turned into organically a business which now blesses moms who've had miscarriages and infant loss. She started that, a lot of people don't know this, because she wanted to do something tactile with her hands. So even if you're not a manual laborer like me, you can find something to build and to create to be your modern day tabernacle. And my question is, because if you're someone like me, so me and Bryant, well, you're a chef, so that you're good to go, man. You already got yours. So here, check this out. No, seriously, this is a great point. If you're Bryant, homeboy makes food for the glory of God. 
Please have me over for dinner. <laughs> no pressure. You guys just got back from vacation, huh? Welcome back. I'm calling you out on the stage. All right. <clears throat> Shameless plug. Hey, Doug, you make cheesecake, bro. <laughs> I'm trying to eat clean, though. You know what I mean? Okay, anyways. <clears throat> All right. Worship team, come on up. Favorite part of the service, we get to respond to what the Holy Spirit is doing. How cool is that? This ain't just head knowledge. This is now the, spirit of, the, the same spirit of God in Bezalel. Remember, last week, Brock, you guys are tabernacles, you're temples. The spirit of God is in you. What is he gifting and calling you to do? And more than likely, it's nothing here. It's out there. Now, we're gonna have a prayer team up here. So Rachel, Vanessa, talk about the prayer team. Vanessa got healed last week. How cool is that? You want me to put the pad for you? used to always struggle. Like this for, I read the book of Acts. And I'm like, man, how come we don't see that today? That's a lie. We do see it today, and that's proof. So prayer team, prayer team, come yeah, on up. Okay. Oh, there we go. That's the spirit of God. Come get prayer for anything, but I want to name two things this morning. One, if you are here and you work with your hands, you're a, what's called a manual laborer. Man, can you just come forward? To we want to bless you and your hands and your job. Like, we want, to, we want to see the spirit of God. If you're a landscaper, that man, people, you go mow the grass, we're like, man, I just, I just sense something different here. And it's because you're filled with the spirit and you're bringing the glory and the power and the presence of Yahweh when you're cutting flowers and mowing grass. Whatever, you're, whatever you do with your hands, Matt, can you just come get prayed for and blessed by these people? We want to see an increase of the Spirit. Paul says in Ephesians to be continuously filled. If you follow Jesus, you already have him in you. But we want more. We want to be a people that are hungry and desperate for a move of God. And revival always happens with prayer first and it spills out of the church. Revival's not for the church. Revival's for the world. Come, if you're hungry. Two, maybe you're here and you're like me and you're not handy. Man, just come get prayer and maybe you start some weird hobby like clay earrings or a garden or a sandcastle and it may seem so stupid and dumb to you and oh, that's just a sandcastle. But what if there was a holy moment between me and my six-year-old son there? Again, we think that's weird because we separate the sacred and the secular. Not so with Jesus. It's all sacred. Come get prayer. And so this is our cry this morning as it is every morning. Come Holy Spirit. We already have two people getting prayer right here. Come Holy Spirit. Breathe. We breathe in your presence, God. Flood this place as the waters cover the seas. Wait, the waters are the seas. Minister to us afresh, Spirit of God. 